Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. We continue with Gaussian processes, so this date doesn't, isn't updated yet. But um, Gaussian process is quite a big topic, and so we will have another session, and possibly next time again. As a reminder, um, last time we looked at these complicated, intimidating looking expressions. So what was the story? Um, we are trying to do regression, so we have some values from some function. Let me put something on the board for this one. So where's the extra chalk? None. <coughs> so the task is given a 2D data set like this, where the x are the input and those are the outputs. In regression, we are trying to fit a function through this one, for example, z1. And there are many possibilities. There's linear regression and other approaches. And Gaussian process is like a very probabilistic Bayesian way of approaching this problem. So the ba main idea in Bayesian reasoning is always that we define a prior distribution for our unknowns. Um, typically, unknowns are parameters, like in linear regression, in Bayesian linear regression, for example, a parameter vector. However, in Gaussian processes, we really have a prior of a function. So the, the unknown is a function. So we don't know what function is a true function. Of course, it could be parameterized by a weight vector, like we did in Bayesian linear regression. But the GP view is more general. Yeah? So here we are really having a probability distribution over the space of functions. Yeah? By the way, the GP being called a process is really an example of a stochastic process. Yeah? You might have heard of Markov chains and other things. So GPs is another instance of a stochastic process, yeah? just as a side note. OK, after having defined a, a prior distribution over the unknowns, yeah? over the unknown random variable, in this case our function f, we also typically specify a likelihood which tells us Given that we know the unknown, how is the data generated? Which in this case means, so how are values calculated if I know a particular location on the x-axis and I know the true function, so what to expect from my measurements? And since we are, won't have perfect measurements, we typically assume a Gaussian distribution around the exact value f of x star, where now this noise variance here um, that is a parameter, basically, that can be either chosen if you know it, or it can be automatically chosen by some model selection procedure. So after having specified the model, ideally, we can mathematically derive a posterior distribution over our functions. And as you know, for Gaussians, everything is nice. So having a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood will lead to a Gaussian posterior for the parametric case, and that's also here for the GP situation that we can derive some posterior distribution over functions, which happens to be a Gaussian process as well. And that is very nice because like starting from some initial knowledge encoded by a mean function and a covariance function, after seeing data, we get an update for these functions. So we have new mean function and we have a new covariance function, which then expresses our knowledge about the function that kind of takes into account the data that we've seen. So, and we, we kind of hand wavily derived some expression from our knowledge of Gaussian distributions, yeah? And then basically by using the kernel trick on these expressions, we found an expression and we haven't proved it, we just derived it a little bit hand wavily um, for the mean function, for the covariance function. So this um, suggestion here for the posterior mean function, for the posterior covariance function, is one that is compatible with the case of Bayesian linear regression. And that should be, um, that should tell us enough that we are here on safe grounds and this is probably the right answer because there are not so many possibilities to plug these things together. So this is in principle the answer now of GP regression. Now, how can we do it practically? When you look at implementations on the web, they are typically, the code is getting very short. And usually doesn't talk about a mean function and a covariance function. But um, <coughs> instead, you right away do the prediction for some new position. So basically, you are sampling from a certain Gaussian distribution, which is written right here, right? 
So suppose now we have a data set, capital X and um, vector Y, then you can calculate the kernel matrix, the KXX, that is just a matrix that can be calculated from the training data. We can add something onto the diagonal, okay, fine. We can invert it and we can multiply it with Y minus M sub X, where Y are the true values, M sub X are the mean function evaluated at our training locations. Then this expression together, yeah, what shape does it have? Does anyone know? So is it a matrix or is it a vector? So maybe while you're thinking about it, I write it on the board. Okay, so just a second. So let's write it, um, let's take the mean function in this case, which is basically the same thing. So we have f of x after seeing data, so let's call it f sub n. I hope you're still thinking about it. Maybe then I don't talk so you can think for yourself. Okay, so I copied it now. So after seeing training data, then this is basically the function that could be evaluated for any test point. Yeah, so this is a, a new test point. And this is a noise-free answer, right? We would expect if we would observe at the location x some value that there's some additional noise with variance sigma on top of it. We will talk about this technical detail on some other slides. But let's first look at this function and let's see how it looks like. First of all, um, so what is the shape of the y? Do you know? Yes? Yeah, so that's a vector. And then if that, is, that should work, then that's better a vector too. So it's something like this, right? Vector minus a vector. Then we have the kernel matrix, which looks like this. Sigma times the identity matrix, it's yet another matrix. And then we take the inverse of that one. Okay, and this thing here is a row vector, okay? Because we have one single vector x, or it could be a scalar, and we calculate the inner product with all of these. Note that typically we, we would say that k a comma b, so that's a scalar, right? And k um, x, comma b, so that would be a column vector. So I would say in this case n cross 1, okay, that would be a 1 cross 1. And then there's also k a comma x, and that would be a, a row vector, which I would write as 1 cross n. And of course there's also k of x comma x, which is now a full matrix, n cross n. Okay, so this is just to remind you of this notation. So where's my eraser over here? Okay, so far so good. So this thing is a row vector. And what about the m of x? What is that one? Yes? It's a scalar. Okay, so it's a dot. Fine. So So the summation of two matrices is a matrix. The inverse of a squared matrix is a squared matrix. So we will have here a squared matrix times a vector, times a row vector, plus a scalar, OK? And so basically it means if we now combine those two into one, we will get a vector. So this will be equal to scalar plus row vector times a column vector, yeah? So the whole thing simplifies and let's give this guy some name. Let's call it alpha, okay? And then what we get is basically um, m of x plus k of x comma capital X times alpha. Or if you like, you can also rewrite it. So it's alpha transpose times k capital X times little x. Okay? So that's what we get. 
um, notice that in a way what we are calculating here, here we are calculating similarities to our training locations. And if we are close to locations, we will have the same function values y. So basically, this is calculating weights, how to calculate the linear combination of the entries in the y to get a good answer here. However, some of the points in the training data set might be close by, so we would overcount those y's, right? So there might be very, x might be very similar to x1 and also very similar to x2, so you get a weight of 1 for both of them, or close to 1. And that would then overcount the entry y1 and y2. For that reason, we need to normalize this weight vector appropriately. And so this is a normalization term that is appropriately normalizing the term. So why is it normalizing? Because in this matrix k, x, x, let's say x1 and x2 are quite similar, then we will have some off-diagonal entries for the first two columns and first two rows, for example. Okay? And then when you invert it, that just turns out to be the right normalization over here. So in a way, everything that, is, that we are doing here is we are calculating an average of the observed outputs, yeah, where we take the weight from the similarity with respect to the locations. Okay, so that's what's happening. Let's simplify it even further. So let's say we say m of x is constant zero. Yeah, then the whole thing gets even simpler. Then the f n of x. Let's write it out once. So it's this k x x times kxx plus sigma squared identity inverse times y, OK? And um, so in this case, really, uh, we get a quite simple form. Yeah? And now if you would like to implement it, and I think you should implement it in question three, yeah, then all you have to do is you need to calculate the kernel matrix. You add something to the diagonal of the kernel matrix. You calculate the inverse, and you multiply it with the y. Okay? And this is giving you then some alpha. And now if you want to get the output for some other values, you calculate the similarity of your x with all the other data points of your training set, and you multiply it with the alpha. Yeah? So it's just a linear combination. Again, similar to a support vector machine, yeah, in a support vector machine, we are also just averaging values, right? So I think it was something like alpha i times uh, y i times k x i times x. So I think that was the output that we get from some SVM. And this output then is typically thresholded, right? Typically, we have some plus b, so we have some offset as well. And so what we, are what we are doing here is we are also averaging the y's with some alphas, right? So we also, and the weight that this y is getting depends on the similarity that we have. So let's rewrite this one in this notation. Basically, then we have something like alpha Hadamard product with the y. Okay, so this is just changing the signs of the alpha. Yeah, the alphas are all positive, I think. And so here we are changing. That was one of the constraints, since they are Lagrange multiplier. And we are multiplying them with the signs. So some of them get a positive sign, some get a negative sign. And this vector gets multiplied with exactly k of x, capital X, comma, little x. So we are calculating the similarity of little x with all the locations. And then depending on the similarity, we are picking some of the alphas and summing them up. And that will be the answer. Yeah? So it's, it's very similar working. Yeah? But the starting point for this one was very different. We started with this intuition with maximum margin and something, and um, then came up with some Lagrange multipliers, alpha, and so on and so forth. But when you look at the form here, the form looks very much the same as for the GP solution. However, there's an important difference in the SVM world. So maybe label, let's label this box as SVM. Typically, the alpha is sparse. So it's 0 for almost all of the examples. Yeah? And only for the so-called support vectors, the alpha is non-zero. So this is like nice and efficient to calculate then at runtime. 
For the GP, it's not so nice and efficient to calculate. If your training set has a million examples, you have to calculate the similarity to, to a million examples. So here's no guarantee that anything gets sparse or something, okay? Okay, now back to question three on your exercise sheet. I think you should implement it, and all you have to do is calculate the kernel matrix, add something, then you have these combined matrix. Often it's called Z. I think in my code that I will show you in a second, I call it Z. And then you typically use this Linsolve function. So there's this Linsolve, and you call it something like this. So what is it computing? So basically, it's solving the problem z to the minus 1 times y. So that is computed by the Linsolve. It's solving a linear system where y is equal to z times some other vector. And so you are interested in this vector v. And it's more numerical stable to do it like this. Okay? But I will show you a notebook in a second with lots of code. And basically, you can dissect my code and pick out the pieces to, for the solution for the exercise. Okay. So as I said, you calculate a kernel matrix. You somehow have to invert it, but you never really invert the matrix. You solve a system, so you calculate the alpha, yeah, and then you can evaluate it at other locations by calculating this kernel matrix. Yeah. So that's why um, in Gaussian processes last time. Everything looks super theoretical, and it's like you are, you are lost in equations and lost in expressions. However, the expressions are always the same for Gaussian distribution, so they're just the usual ones, but now written up in a very general form for functions, okay? But the, the mechanism and the principle is still the same as was for the multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, once you have this mass, then you could have some assumptions like the mean function equal to zero and so on and so forth. And sometimes at the end you get something quite simple. And that is also the solution that you typically see in textbooks or that you see on blogs, on GPs or something, that then don't derive the details, okay? So far so good. Everyone's approximately happy with that one. However, I like a lot this fully Bayesian way of thinking, starting with two parameters, m and k, which are functions, and then seeing data, and then having two new parameters, m sub n and k sub n. And that's how I would like to implement it, just for fun. Yeah? Because then you could really see one more data point, and you get an update on your GP. And you see another data point, and you get an update on your GP. In the implementation shown on the board, Basically, I do this all only once, right? So I'm once calculating this z and so on and so forth. And so here I don't have a chance to do more updates to it because I, I didn't wrote down even the, the, the kernel function here, the posterior kernel function is necessary if you want to do it fully Bayesian. So let me show you a, a functional implementation of that one, okay? And I think that might be quite instructive. Okay, so where do we have it? Oh, there are some error messages. That's not a good sign. Um, let me reset. Let's restart. So here is lots of material in here. In particular, there are also the links to the books and to some other, um, other sources that might be important. So I, I built everything on top of NumPy for visualization. I still like Plotly. There will be some optimization involved, but only for the model selection, so for the plain vanilla GP stuff, if I don't want to learn the hyperparameters, then everything is just simple linear algebra. I only need Linsolve, okay? So let's start with defining some basic mean and covariance functions, okay? So here are two mean functions, and the code looks ridiculously simple because there's not much happening. So this is the mean function. It takes any A and returns something of the same shape as A, but with zeros, okay? So that is the zeros mean function, and this is the ones mean function. So why is that, isn't that overdoing it a little bit? No, it's not, because then I can have a GP update function that takes a mean function and spills out a new mean function. And so I need a starting point to get, I, I could, of course, initialize always something like this to zero, but it's nicer really to define a function for this. Similarly, here for the covariance functions or kernel functions, I have here a couple of kernel functions. They all end in underscore kernel, okay? I need some 
helper function, some square distances, and some all minus function, whatever that is. They are just needed for some weird kernels. There's a rational quadratic kernel. It's from Rasmus and Williams' book. And some periodic kernels and Matern kernels. So there are some really weird ones. So maybe, let's see. So do I have the Rasmussen? There it is. So here we have the book. And you can legally download it. I just want to show you because that's like the, the usual reference. And let's see where's the chapter on the kernels. So what did I say? Equation 4.19. So let's jump there, and then we can also see some pictures. Blah, blah, blah. Can I click on this one? No, can't. So let's. So two pages to make it easy to size. No. Hey. No. OK, so there's a whole chapter on covariance functions. And everything that's in here can be also used for kernels, for support vector machines. But they are more Bayesian, so they call it covariance functions. And um, maybe I should only show a single page, then I can go through it better. So there's some math behind it, which is only interesting if you really want to get deep into it. So there's Bochner theorem, for example. That's some stuff from functional analysis and about Fourier transform. So it's all, so you can also drill deeper if you really want to. But you can also be just a user of GPs by just having these kernel functions that other people came up with. But there's something deeper in. So here's the squared exponential covariance function. That's the first one. And the way it's formulated, it's formulated where you plug in a single parameter r. And so this r is just the difference between a and b. So it's just the, the distance between those two points. And the squared exponential can be seen like some nonlinear function applied to the distance of two data points, OK? So then there's the more weird one, the so-called Matern class of covariance functions. And they look much more weird. So they are really complicated. So they use the modified Bessel functions. Yeah? And I don't know whether you know this book, Abramovitz Stegun. It's nice to look at it. It's a thick book. It's full of functions, OK? So there are only functions in this book that people came up with as solutions for certain differential equations or whatever, whatever. And it's, yeah, it's quite impressive, this book. So there's probably also an online version of the material. Anyway, so this is another covariance function. And it's far from trivial to prove that that one is positive definite. But it is positive definite. And it leads to some, it has some interesting properties. It leads to some processes if you sample from them. So you get some functions that look like this. So the blue function is sampled from a Matern kernel, OK? Which is really nice, because typically, when you think of these linear regression things, you think of smooth functions, right? But the Matern function, it's one that is like very wiggly. And this looks like a stock price, right? So you could model maybe stock prices with this or something. So it really looks like something quite fancy. Also, if you have the, a heartbeat or something, a heartbeat is also not a continuously smooth function, but it's one with a spike in there. And so there you need these kind of kernels. And they, they make sense. And there's the mathematics for that one as well. So there's a large collection. So there are some, some more. OK, so that should be fine. I just wanted to show you the Martian kernel. Um, anyway, um, so here's an implementation of it. OK, so of course, I, this is the Bessel function. I just looked it up and plugged it in and then played around with it. And it looks like it works. If you find bugs, please let me know. So then that might be the reason why some of my code does not work, OK? Because they sometimes we had weird, weirdly with some inputs. So one thing that I did for my kernel functions is they always have the input AB and then HP, where HP stands for hyperparameters, OK? So they always typically have hyperparameters, like the squared exponential, of course, has this sigma squared term, right? This normalization, and it's not a normalization, it's like a a length scale. And more precisely, that is the so-called um, input length scale. So the input distances are divided by this length scale. However, there's another parameter called the output variance. And that is one that tells us how, f how large our values could be. And we will play around with these kernels um, maybe today or next time. And I show you the effect of changing the output variance or the input variance, what the effect of these parameters are. 
Of course, there's also a linear kernel implementation, which is a very simple one, right? It's just the inner product of two things. Okay, so those are my kernel implementations. Um, maybe I should evaluate it all. So that one, that one. I can run some tests. That is typically only done to, to check whether the, the matrices are aligned, right? It's, it's hard to know whether these are meaningful values, so that's very hard to tell. Here are a couple of more tests where I'm having different shapes and different hyperparameters and playing around with it a bit. But what we could do, we could of course look sometimes at the kernel matrix. And so let's take a very simple data set that we understand super good. So this is the data set. It has 100 points and they are spread from the interval from 0 to 10. And they are sorted. So the smallest point is the 0 and then I'm having in small steps I go across the whole interval. And for that one, I know how the squared exponential kernel should look like, right? Suppose the first column, the zeros column, is telling me the similarity of the zeros point with all the other points. And of course, it is very similar to the close by points, but then it drops off to zero, okay? And similarly for points in between, there are, there are similar for points close by and not so similar that are far away. Let's change some of these values here. So I think the first one was the outer length scale. So let's change that one to 4. Let's see what's happening. And you see the picture looks the same. However, the scale here did change. Okay, so I can generate now larger values. Why that might be interesting? Because um, it could be, uh, let's say, like here on the board. I'm having a linear combination of some output values with some some weights over here, and sometimes it could be a good idea to generate larger numbers here, yeah, to get larger outputs as well. Yeah. So let's change the um, inner length scale as well, so let's change it to 2, and there you see now it gets narrower. So now you have less friends, okay, so you are only similar to the points close by. We can have it even more narrow. That basically means that the functional values for points at the beginning of the interval can be very different from the ones that are far away. Yeah? Because the kernel matrix basically is a covariance matrix. So how does the values at the beginning of the interval vary together with the points far away from the interval? So the input length scale tells us something whether we have an overall smooth function or a function that is very wiggly, yeah? where close by points only are correlating with each other. Of course, more surprising now is how the Mattern kernel looks like, since I said that you can have these um, sudden jumps also up and down. So maybe let's, let's try that. I don't have it as code here, but let's add this. I think that's interesting. So, oops. Ah, no, I'm messing up the code. Exponential. So, so let's copy it in here and let's plug in the Mattern kernel. For that one, of course, we need to check how many parameters do we need. We need an output variance, a length scale, and then we need some parameter new. So let's read the comment. So for new greater than k, okay, whatever k is, we get at least k times differentiality. Okay, interesting. So it is something about how often, how smooth the function is. Okay, so let's try it and let's see how it looks like. So it is called Matan kernel. And um, Oh, where am I here? Copy. Oh, that was not the code I wanted to change. Let me ch change, let me redo this back. I'm in the wrong box. Okay, let's go to this box that I just copied, and this one should get, become the Matan kernel, and I need another parameter. Let's take 1.0. Let's see what's happening, okay? Matan kernel not defined. Okay, it's only 1t, fine. Okay, only implemented for vectors. Ah, okay, so fine. So that gets more complicated than I thought. So it's not as easy as I wanted it to be. Hmm. What is the problem here? Only implemented for vectors. Okay, so maybe I need to... What is this reshape minus 1, 1? So this turns it into a row vector, right? And I guess it needs to be reshaped... Ah, okay, so it's only, ah, okay. Um, I think I need to remove that one. 
it's not yet working. How can I vectorize it by reshape minus one? Maybe like this. Okay. Okay, it looks like it takes takes too much time. So there's some struggling with this one. So I haven't tried the Matan kernel enough yet. So but let's try it at home, okay? So I think there's a problem with the shapes because I always have like n dim equals two, but the Matan implementation requires n dim equals one for whatever reason. Okay, anyway, you can see there's lots of time to spend here to get it really running, not only the math right. Okay, but let's continue. I won't fix it now during the during the class. Let's generate some data. Okay, so we need for the data locations x and some values y. Okay, so I do it now here. I have data set equals zero, so that defines my, my data set variable, and then I generate the data. And here are some alternative data sets. They are only called if I choose another data set value. Okay, so very simple. Let's take that one. Um, that is one that looks like this. Okay, it's, it's like a smooth looking function that is more wiggly down here. Okay, um, what do I have to generate here? Okay, I'm, I'm reading it from some file, so it's some older data set that I used before. I'm only taking 17 data points out of this data set here, and then I set already the mean and the covariance function, and I choose the ones that work well on this data set. Yeah? So otherwise, where do I store it? So it's easier to store it right next to the data set, the parameters that work very well. Okay? So I choose the squared exponential kernel for this one, and those are the hyperparameters that work very well. So they are fixed in this case. Okay? So let's do that and plot it. We don't have to plot those. So far, so good. Now we have the data. Now the next step is to get from the prior to the posterior. And for that one now, I want to implement these formulas, m sub n and k sub n. Yeah? So the posterior mean and the posterior covariance function. And this happens in my function update gp, which takes a g, where the g will be a gp, yeah? and it takes data and some hyperparameters. So what is this g? For that one, I define a new data type. I define a simple data type. In Python, you can do this collections dot name tuple, which is a very nice uh, form uh, to get like a new data type called gp with, with two slots. So there are two fields in this data type, dot m and dot k. Yeah? So I get a constructor. gp of prior mean function, prior covariance function is now generating an object that has like two fields or two slots, where the first slot is now the mean function and the second slot is the covariance function. So that is very handy. And now I can use this, yeah, I can use this g by saying g dot m, I get the mean function, and by saying g dot k, I get the covariance function in this case. Okay? And the dot m and dot k, they already find up here in this string. Okay, that's just a Python trick. It's nothing to do with machine learning. Okay, let's see how we update the GP. And for that we need the formulas here, and let's look at the code. First of all, let's calculate the prior mean vector. So that is the m sub x, okay? It is exactly this m sub x, and I call it mx. So it's just applying a my mean function to my data set x. Similarly, I want to calculate the kernel matrix, which is abbreviated as k sub xx in here, and in the code I call it kxx, which is just applying now the kernel function or the covariance function to the data set. And next, I need this function kx, comma little x, which is basically the function in the formula over here called k sub zero. So why is that a function in a? Because the a is the input to my mean function, and the a is also the input to the kernel function. Yeah? And so I need this function somehow. Yeah? I need it later on, because the output of my update gp should be the pair of another mean function and another covariance function, since I want to do functional programming here. So I need this function that takes an x and outputs basically the covariance function applied to little x and the data set x. Okay? That's, are you fine with lambda and this kind of stuff? Yeah, most of you are, maybe. So functional programming is, I think, something very nice. If you haven't learned about it during your studies, please take the classes or, or, or learn it, because it's really abstracting 
So it's, it gives us a way to write down literal expressions like we can do for 17 or 42, but we can write down a literal, literal expression for a function. So this is a function um, that takes an x and outputs g of blah. So let me, so there are some people who don't know lambda, right? So let me just give you an example. So let's say I'm defining here a function ff of x and it is just calculating two times x. Okay, fine. Then I can then I can apply it. So far so good. Another way to do this is to say, let's call it triple f lambda x double point two point x. That's the lambda notation to define a function. Okay? So I'm saying lambda x means we have a function with one input parameter, and for the input parameter I'm calculating this expression. So if your function is as simple as that one, and there's no fancy code in here in between, yeah, but just your function could be written as a single expression, then you can also use the lambda expression, okay? And ideally, um, yeah, this will be the same result, of course. Yeah, so it's the same thing. So why am I using it in here? Yes, I could have used here also a def, right? I could have said def like this, blah, x, bracket return g dot k x comma x comma hp and i think that would have even worked in python but i found it more succinct and more short if i use this lambda notation yeah so that is defining me a function okay next um, i want to know how many data points there are because i need to add something on the diagonal of my kernel matrix okay so I have here my kernel matrix kxx, which I already calculated up here, and I want to add something onto the diagonal. So I need the number of data points. Furthermore, I need this hyperparameter for the noise variance. And by convention, the last entry in my HP vector is the noise. Yeah? So I always need the noise for Gaussian processes here. And uh, the convention is it's the last parameter. In particular, this then will work whatever other hyperparameters are in there. Okay, it's just a very clever choice. I think I copied it from, I guess it's the implementation of Rasmussen and Williams of their original book where they also implemented a lot of these functions in MATLAB. So next I define this matrix that needs to be inverted. So it's this matrix Z and I actually do invert it in this case because I need it also in its inverted form for the posterior covariance function. But let's first calculate the alpha which could be calculated now just by saying z inverse times y minus mx, but I don't do it that way. I'm using the solve function, and that is the stuff that you can chop out to solve exercise number three. Yeah. And once I have all of these, I can define two more functions. So the first one is the mean function, which is applying the current mean function to the a plus calculate the similarity with respect to the data set times the alpha. And similarly for the covariance function, I'm just implemented the formula above. Okay, so let me get rid of that one here. So this one down here is now just an implementation of the formula of the posterior covariance function, right? Where this matrix here, it's the set inverse. And that one needs to be calculated the left and the right vector cannot be calculated beforehand, but they depend on the input A or B. Okay? Fine. And then I'm just returning a new GP object with a new mean and a new posterior um, function. Okay? So that is the function implementation. Your task in exercise three will be to do it by hand and to follow the simple path. Okay? Okay, so far so good. Any questions about this implementation? If not, then let's look at it, whether it works. There will be error messages typically sometimes. So now I defined a data set. I defined a prior mean function. I defined a prior covariance function. Let's calculate the posterior GP. OK, it's not defined yet, so I forgot to evaluate that one. So let's calculate it. And now we have it. So we have a posterior GP. So let's look at it. So posterior GP, it is some object where the slot m is some function that has been defined via lambda and where also the k is some function that has been defined lambda. Just for the Pythonistas among you, there's also these funny locals here. So the thing is, um, for an implementation like that, so I'm implementing here a function, it basically needs to return 
closures, so it needs to know in what context these functions were defined, because this function is referring to alpha, right? But after I'm returning from a function, typically the local variables are erased, right? So alpha gets popped off from the stack, and it's no longer there anymore. Similarly, this zinf is no longer there anymore. So part of this function definition, if I return it, must be the local variables that are relevant for the definition of these functions, okay? That's why here there are something dot locals, okay? But this is just, again, some implementation details. Okay, this is a demo of that one. That's it, basically. Now, this is Bayesian inference with GPs, right? However, of course, we want to look at the functions. We want to look at the mean function. We want to look at the covariance function. So let's visualize that once, okay? And that will be the next stuff. Let's visualize the GP. And let me first show you the plot, and then I show you the implementation. So that is a typical plot that we want to see. So we want to see the data. Then we want to see the mean function, which is this, this bluish line. And then we somehow want to visualize the covariance function, right? And the way I did it here is that at every location, I'm calculating the covariance function at that location, comma, that location. So I calculate the covariance function at 5, comma, 5. And that gives me the variance, basically, of the current estimate of my mean function. The mean function is the mean, and the variance is the variance for the local Gaussian. That's basically the same as the ones from the posterior predictive distribution, OK? And then what about the other one? That is the mean plus two standard deviations, OK? And it gives us some insight into the shape of this function. So how do you implement it? I'm not going super into the detail, but basically you need to call these go.scatter stuff if you want to really plot whole areas. And yeah, if you have something similar like that and you want to apply it somewhere, look at this code. So I also looked at other people's code to figure it out. It's kind of um, tedious because you want to have it also with some alphas and some, some so it could, should be transparent and these kind of sums. Anyway. There's another function that allows you to plot the prior and the posterior, but I don't use that one now. I mainly use the, the one that just um, plots the posterior. OK, so far, so good. Um, so that's nice. So that's a nice answer to a problem, right? It also tells us, like here, where there's not so much data, yeah, the variances are larger. It also tells us where I have, don't have at all data, like the variance really go, go up. Yeah? And if I would change the range here now, I, let's say I, I change the range from, um, yeah, from the minimum that I had here, but minus 10 plus 10, let's do it like that. And then you see that the answer looks quite boring outside where I don't have any data, right? Why is that the case? Because, yes, I will take the mean function where I know nothing, right? So that can be very easily seen from the, um, from the mass that we still have on the board. If my x is not similar at all to any of the data points, locations, yeah, this vector will be 0, yeah, almost 0. And I multiply this 0 vector with something interesting, but it will give us a 0, and the output is just the mean function. In this case, it was 0. Similarly, for the covariance function, which I haven't written up here, but the covariance function approximately is the covariance function at a and b, the old one, plus Calculate the similarity to your data for A, calculate the similarity of your data to B, and in between is some, some kernel function, uh, kernel matrix. And then basically, if they are not similar at all to the data, then this information is ignored, and you have your prior covariance function, and that's the relevant one. Okay, that's why we don't see anything over here. Yeah? So what does it also tell us? Oh, we should be very careful with extrapolation. Yeah? So interpolation means finding values between data points. Extrapolation means extrapolating into some areas where we don't have data. Yeah, so that might be, let's say, you have some measurements of some temperatures in Düsseldorf, in Dortmund, and you are interested in something in between. I don't know what's in between, but let's say there's a city in between. Yeah? That's interpolation. However, let's say you want to infer now what's, in, what's the temperature in Cologne, then you would have to extrapolate your data to something. Or what is it in Munich? Um, that sounds like something, OK, you better don't extrapolate, right? So that's kind of dangerous. However, that's often what we want to do. 
thinking of climate models, right? So we have like recordings of the climate or of CO2 or something, and we have it for the past 200 years, and we want to extrapolate into the future. So you have to be careful how you model the kernels. So you shouldn't do it like this, yeah? But there is an example which shows you how to do it, how to possibly do it. Okay, so that's a visualization of my answer, kind of, okay? The nice thing, it also gives us uncertainties. However, be aware, if I change the hyperparameters, yeah, then I get a totally different answer, yeah? So this very much depends on the hyperparameters, how the function looks, and also how wide the variances are. But qualitatively, it kind of makes sense. So there's another way to visualize GPs, yeah? And we can sample from them. And I think that's question number one in your exercises. And here's an implementation of it. So have a look at it and get inspired. So basically, sampling means I want to get samples from a GP, yeah? So those are samples from a GP prior in this case, yeah? Where I haven't seen any data. And now how do you do this? Um, Basically, what you do is, um, let me show you on the board. If you have a GP with or without data, in general, we have a mean function and a covariance function. Those two things are defining our GP. Okay? And now, in order to sample from it, I need to specify points, locations, where I want to sample it. And typically what I'm doing is, let's say I'm taking from 0 to 10, and I put n data points ev evenly spread out. So I would use some functions like lint space or something. So I'm generating an x, right? So some x test. And that is basically some lint space, 0, 10, whatever. Let's take 1,000 data points. And this is like putting lots of points here. And then for those x tests, I'm evaluating basically the mean function. That's it. And if I do it with my prior mean function, I'm just getting the function 0. However, if I'm doing it with my posterior mean function, I'm getting something interesting. And then I'm getting something like a function that looks like this, yeah, that ideally follows the data. However, what happens where I don't have data? Right? You, you remember these pictures that were looking like this, where the variance is going up. If I really now want to sample from that one, I'm not just taking the mean, but I'm now sampling from a Gaussian distribution with that mean. Okay? So I'm sampling now my y's um, from a Gaussian distribution, where I'm evaluating the mean at my test locations, and I'm evaluating a covariance matrix for my test locations. And sampling a y gives me also data uh, values y, basically, from 0 to 10. And then I can sample those. And they will look like this. So they go kind of through this, but not always. And where I don't have data, they are more spread out. And where I have data, they are kind of going through the points, kind of. OK? <coughs> this looks very nice. Have we really sampled a function? No, we have not. We've chosen finitely many data points, in this case, 1,000, OK? And I'm sampling just a 1,000 dimensional vector. However, the data set has been set up such I can now easily plot my y. I can plot the x against the y, OK? And then I get a nice line like this. So I'm never really sampling really a function. I'm only sampling evaluations of my function at finitely many data points. And that's why I can just use the usual Gaussian distribution to do this. So I can just use Ren N. But I need to be, yeah, I need to be a little bit clever about sampling the from the from the random Gaussian. So here's an implementation. So it's always from time to time nice to do it by hand. So a way to do it is uh, so you have a mean and some covariance matrix. Basically, you sample from a standard normal Gaussian distribution, so that is one with mean zero, and with standard deviation, the identity matrix, yeah? And you shift the result by the mean. So that is a way to get a different mean. How do you get a different covariance matrix? You need to multiply 
this matrix by some other matrix, basically by something like the covariance matrix, right? But it's not exactly the covariance matrix. It is some square root of the covariance matrix, and that can be calculated from the Koleski um, decomposition of the matrix, okay? If you don't know what a Koleski decomposition is, just store for yourself. It's a very efficient, um, it's, it's some, some numerical algorithm which calculates a square root of a matrix, okay? So, and if you copy this code, yeah, and you don't trust, you shouldn't trust it immediately, right? So you should always check it. Yeah, don't trust my code that you copy. So here's the test code. So let's test it. So I'm taking a random covariance matrix. How do I generate it? I take a random matrix, three by three, and I multiply it with itself transpose. So this ensures that I get a symmetric positive definite matrix. So this is always a positive definite symmetric matrix, yeah? But a random one, okay? Then I calculate the Koleski decomposition of my sigma, just as I did in the code, yeah? And then I'm um, generating some data, why? Yeah? By multiplying the L with the random sample and calculating the covariance matrix of the sample data. And then I can compare yeah, this covariance matrix with the sigma that I had before. And as it turns out, they are quite similar. Yeah? We get almost the same numbers. Wow, they are really very similar in this case. Okay, maybe I should take fewer numbers. Okay, this looks like a, like a bug. Okay, no, this is something. Uh, okay, so let's me, let me put a print so that everything looks the same. Okay, the first two are the sigma and the Koleski decomposition, and they are, of course, exactly the same. So the first check here tells us, okay, Koleski works. It's calculating some square root of my matrix. However, what about the covariance matrix? And there you see, yeah, it is kind of okay, right? The 2.3 is something like the 1.8, and the 0 0.7 is something like the 0 0.6. But of course, I can run this for more data, and then the numbers get closer and closer, okay? So that is the check that you need to do, because, I mean, who knows, right? Maybe that is the right implementation, right? So let's try it, and let's see whether we can catch it. Oh, looks like it doesn't matter. Okay, so we learned something. Wow, funny, okay? But there are other variations that you could do which make it wrong, okay? So it looks like it doesn't matter whether you multiply with the L or with the L transpose. I'm surprised, okay? So far so good. So this allows us now to calculate from a multivariate Gaussian distribution given a mean and a covariance matrix. So why do we want this? Okay, because the mean function allows us to calculate as a mean and the covariance matrix, a uh, covariance function allows us to calculate a covariance matrix, okay? So let's continue. So here's more test code. Okay, let's forget about that one. So let's now plot GP samples. So for that one now, I'm taking data locations, X, and I'm taking a GPG, where the GPG, again, again has this dot M and the dot K, okay? And then I'm evaluating first the mean function on these locations, which will be a lint space from zero to something, and I'm calculating the covariance matrix plus some noise in this case. And then I'm saying, so how many samples do I want to have? N equals three is the default, but you can generate more. And I'm just sampling a, a vector Y from a random Gaussian, right? just using my implementation. And I'm always using the same mu and the same sigma because that's fixed, but I want to sample from this Gaussian distribution. And then I plot it by plotting the x against the y, where the y's are changing every time. Okay, let's do that. And so here's our first visualization with five, but I can also just do whatever, three, or I can also just, whatever, do 20, whatever. And this is giving you a feeling whether this thing looks right, right? Is that what you expect to see with, uh, before seeing the data, right? You could say, no, oh, they are a little bit too wiggly. I would expect smoother functions. Okay, no problem. We could change the hyperparameters, right? So the smoothness, I think it's the, this parameter. So let's make it, let's change it and let's see what we get. Okay, changing it to one didn't change something. Okay, now we have more smoother functions. And then we say, okay, uh, that's maybe a bit too much. So maybe like this. In practice, how you could do it, 
So maybe you have a, a real function that you actually know this is some real function that you want to, but your data might come from a different origin. Then you show your expert images of these samples and of some real data. And if the expert cannot tell which is real and which is random, yeah, then you found the right parameters. Yeah? Of course, it could happen here that these 20, 20 is a bit too much, right? So we never are get large values like that. So that can be done with the other hyperparameter, with the, I think that is called the output variance. So we can limit that one to 1.0, and then we are now smaller. Yeah, you see that with these kind of parameters, you can now design a prior yeah, that kind of matches your expectations. And if you use a Matern class or some other rational quadratic or whatever, if the implementation would have been right, I could have shown you, yeah, then you would get samples from these other classes as well. OK, so far so good. Let's take some data. Let's visualize the posterior GP. Basically, what we are doing now, we are generating a posterior GP using our update GP function that we defined above. And then we use the same code and just draw samples from it. OK, so and that's what we get. So now I change the parameters, right? The hyperparameter now is doesn't allow so large values anymore. OK, so I, maybe I should change them back here. So before doing the inference, maybe I should change this output variance again to, um, I don't know, 10. Let's see whether that's good. OK, that looks fine, right? It's going through the data points. And um, let's see what's happening if I change the input variance as well. So let's put it to, so we're getting something more wiggly. So it, it has a larger variance in between, because basically the length scale at the x-axis now is smaller, which means you don't care so much for your neighbors, only if they are really close by, then you care for your neighbors. I would say now from looking at this, this is a little bit too much. So let's increase it again. Yeah, uh, this might be better, yeah. But it's a bit eyeballing here. Okay, so far so good. Um, there's a very nice animation also, which is super fancy, which uh, was invented by Philip Hennig who's a former colleague of mine and who's like the GP expert where I got some of the material and if I have a question, I would ask him. So here's a very nice visualization. And I first show it to you and then I show you something how, how to implement it. So this is also a super fancy one. So basically here we are sampling three curves, yeah? And then we are animating them according to the distribution. Yeah, and in order to understand what's happening here, yeah, let me show you something on the board. So where's my eraser? Down here. I first explained to you the animation for a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, OK? And then I, it should be clear how to generalize it to a case like that one. So suppose you want to sample from a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, OK? So let's say x1 and x2. And now it's not a coincidence that this is called x1 and x2. Those are two possible locations on, on an axis like this, right? And depending on how close they are, right, the points are correlated or not. So let's say the points are not very close, then basically I'm having a Gaussian distribution which is like isotropic, so it's like Every direction kind of has the same extension, yeah? Let's say the points are close by to each other, where close by means with respect to the kernel function, OK? In that case now, my Gaussian distribution now more looks like an ellipsoid. What does it mean? It means, OK, if I choose a value for x1, let's say uh, z1, that basically also means that I will have a certain value for x2. So they're very correlated. So the more it gets like um, thinner, yeah, the stronger they are correlated. And that's basically the effect of both kernel functions. When you have two points and they are from far away to close by, basically they get larger and la uh, stronger and stronger correlated. OK, so far so good. Let's say those, this, is, this is our two-dimensional Gaussian now, because we are only sampling our functions now for two points. So now. Let's sample a single point. Let's say that one. How could I now nicely animate it? By letting it go around in circles like this. OK? 
So those would be a nice animation for Gaussian samples. It gets more interesting if I have more data points, they will go on this, and another one will go on the inner circle, okay? And this can be generalized also to higher dimensions. So if I have a thousand data points, we are in thousand dimensions, having a thousand dimensional Gaussian distribution, which is basically a, a 1,000 dimensional cigar. Yeah? It's some elliptical thing, some elliptical shape, where the thing goes towards the diagonal for, for coordinate axes, which correspond to close by data points. Yeah? And you have more like a circular shape for points that are far away from each other. And now, every point on my cigar yeah, is one possible function that kind of makes sense. And now if I have one sample from my high dimensional Gaussian, I can now take a large circle around the cigar and each point corresponds to a function. And that's basically what we're seeing here. Kind of makes sense? No? No, not, okay, so let's say we have a two dimensional Gaussian. I'm sampling a single point and now to have a nice animation, I could, I could let it go around in circles like that one, right? And, um, okay, maybe let's, let's push this example further. So, now those are those two points, okay? Or those two locations on the x-axis. And now I'm, I want to sample values y. So, um, uh, maybe my example is not good, but what it basically means is um, both values will kind of grow at the same time, so they both go up and down depending on whether they are close by or not. Or maybe this is not a, not a good picture. Maybe that's a confusing, confusing one. I'm now confused as well. Where is Y? So that's the thing. So where is Y? Okay, so that's maybe why you're also confused. So for good reasons. Okay, so... That was wrong. So this is y1 and this is y2. Maybe now it makes more sense. So we have a Gaussian distribution for the pair y1 and y2. I'm glad you asked. So basically it says the shape of this ellipsoid depends on your locations x1 and x2, right? Because that's how you calculate the covariance matrix you will calculate as uh, k x1, x1, k x1, x2, k x2, x1, and k. Okay, so this is your covariance matrix. And then there's a certain mean. In this case, the mean, or let's say, let's call it mu. So it's m of x1 and m of x2. And in this example, it is zero, right? And then this determines the shape of my ellipse. Yeah? And now if I sample from that one, it's like throwing darts at the board, right? And here most points in this area, a few points outside. Those are the random samples. And the random samples are sampling me a y1 and a y2 simultaneously. And depending on the correlation in here, I'm getting very similar large values. I'm getting very similar small values. Okay, so now I can also have this other plot here. So let's say I'm only drawing it like, let's say with something like that. So just having two points. Where now the height here is y1 and the other height is y2. Okay, and now if I'm having a point and let it go in circles around here, it corresponds to those two points going up and down together in sync, right? If the points are quite far, if, I, if the circle is more like this, then kind of they could go up and down more independently of each other, okay? But there are some subtleties that, that I don't like, so also on a circle it looks very regular what's happening here, but it shouldn't be too regular. But I think that's what we're seeing. At least that's how I generated these nice, nice animations. So maybe we're getting to the limits of the animations. But now, okay, so to repeat. So to plot a GP, I'm taking finitely many locations 
And for these finitely many locations, I calculate a mean vector and a covariance matrix. And from this high dimensional vector, I can sample with the rand n. Fine. But I need to correct for the mean and the covariance. And then I can just plot the x locations against the y values, and that is giving me a nice curve. If I'm only having two points, I could have a diagram like that as well, where I'm having only like the, the two possibilities, y1, y2. And basically, every point here on the board is a combination of those two. And the Gaussian distribution is telling me what is more likely or not. And depending on whether x1 and x2 is close by, y1 and y2 are very correlated or not. And another way to plot it is that I'm making this curve, right? where I now have made these circles. And they will go up and down if I go in circles like that in this distribution. OK, now in, for, for 1,000 points along this interval here, I would have a 1,000 dimensional space like that. And I have a 1,000 dimensional ellipsoid, ellipsoidal form. And I can also go around in circles like that. And every point is giving me another function. OK? Now it's much clearer to me, too. Yes, exactly, yeah. Basically, I'm going around in, on these ellipse things. So I'm having one sample, and I'm looking for one that is close by, so that, that I can come back to the one where I was. Another question? Yeah, in higher dimensional space, wouldn't it be like a circle or something like that? Good point. So it's not unique, right? So let's say you take the globe, yeah, and you are standing in Dortmund. Then there are many circles like an equator shape that go around through Dortmund, right? And so you can randomly choose one. Yeah? OK. So let's look again at the code. So this, at least, it is some description of the distribution. It should be just a visualization of how random, of what to expect. Of course, it's now more interesting to look at a posterior GP, right? And Ah, there we get a bug. OK, what is not defined? Oh, it's not defined yet. OK, let me just execute this. Um, blah. OK, now this is the, the, the posterior one. And there you see that where there's no data, we have lots of fluctuations. And where there is data, we have little fluctuation. OK? The whole point of this plot is just to stress that the output of a GP is a distribution of a function. It's not a single definite function, but it's really a distribution. Of course, there's a single mean function. That is the one that we are often interested in. However, there is more. There's also a covariance function that then can be visualized like that. Yeah? OK. So far, so good. So we, if you want to get more into the details of the implementation, so I'm really doing it here from scratch. So here I'm really, here's the code to sample from an ellipse from a random ellipse. And so there's some, some details, but it's all self-contained. So there's no magic happening or no library function or something used. OK, I'm using again Koleski here, but that's it. OK, and as you can see here, I'm, I'm taking a random circle. Yeah? So I'm taking an arbitrary one, since there are many choices. OK, so far so good? Great. OK, so that is this nice way of visualizing things. And that should stress that there's more than one solution. Let's go on with the slides now. So there's another, yet another view of the GP. And by now, I think I said most of it already. But this is another nice, very short way to think about Gaussian processes. Yeah? And in a way, it's all said. But I think it's good to go through it, because there are some subtleties to look at. So, that, that was our, our big definition, which was like very mass-like, right? So we say a Gaussian process with these two parameter functions, yeah, is a probability distribution over functions. And how are these infinite objects defined? Typically by collapsing them onto finitely many locations and then using properties that are well-behaved, like all these finitely, uh, finite length vectors should be just from a Gaussian multivariate distribution where the parameters are naturally calculated from the mean function, from the covariance function, OK? So far, so good. That's how we usually do it. So this can be also um, used or written very succinct as Gaussian processes or a Gaussian process as finite locations are Gaussians, OK? So that's it. 
if you have finitely many locations, then you have a Gaussian distribution with certain parameters. So if we assume that a function f is coming from a GP, yeah, then for any locations, the values are jointly Gaussians. Yeah, so that's a more succinct way of writing the more formal definition from before, where there's a mean vector and the covariance matrix. So far, so good. So now let's say we have training and test data. Let's call our training data x sub 1 and y sub 1, and our test data x sub, x sub 2 and y sub 2. Okay? And let's say for now we have a noise-free setup. So let's say our sigma is equal to 0 for simplicity. That means we have finitely many locations, and they are all jointly Gaussians. So I can also combine the training data set and the test data set and have a big finite set of locations, and they will be jointly Gaussian, written like this, right? So the vector, when I stack the y vector on top of the y1 vector on top of the y2 vector, I have a longer vector, but that is also jointly Gaussian, okay? So we never have to talk about functions or something like this here. So I'm just saying I'm having this big Gaussian distribution, and that is describing everything that can happen. So the x1 and the y1 could be your observed data, and the x2 could be the locations on the x-axis where you want to plot a sample from the posterior GP, right? Or there could be query points for interpolation or for extrapolation. The parameters here are also not functions anymore. They are really collapsed functions. We collapse them onto finitely many values. We plugged in the, the, the input locations, the output locations, and so on and so forth. So this is a very simple look at the GP setup. Because now, what we actually want to do is, what is the distribution of y given y1, x1, and x2? That's it. So that is GP inference. And that is actually also how it's often implemented. Then suddenly you only need to know how to deal with Gaussian distributions, how to calculate, for example, marginals, or how to calculate conditionals. And this is a slide that I just copied from the lecture on the Gaussian distribution. And maybe by now you can appreciate that we looked at it and found out these nice properties, because now we can just take these formulas for p of y2 given y1, right? And thus this formula is the answer. When you look at the structure, it looks very much like the stuff that we've seen before, right? So we have these, some vector that gets corrected by some linear algebra stuff, right? Where the b in this case, I think, is something about the similar, basically, how does the test set correlate with the training set, right? So that's the upper part in this big covariance matrix here. So the A are the uh, inner correlations inside the training data set, but the B are the ones that are, how is the training data set related to the test data set? So if they are not related at all, the B will be zero, which means this bag expression is completely ignored. Right? or uh, this back expression is completely ignored. However, if not, this will tell us how to take a linear combination of our training locations. Yeah? So you see that this formula down here is exactly the same as the Gaussian process stuff without some of the complicated things. Similarly, the one over at the back for the covariance matrix, so that is basically again saying we start with the covariance matrix that we have in our test data, yeah? And we can reduce the variance by the training data, where we have to calculate the similarity of the test to the training data, and then kind of correct with it with some expression. Yeah? So that is the back part here. So let's apply it now here. So the applying it and plugging everything in, yeah, just using the formula from the last slide, yeah, we get exactly the formulas that we've seen before. But without talking about stochastic processes and all these things. Yeah? We just use the thing, GPs on finitely many locations are Gaussians. And from that, we can derive already everything. So far, so good? Almost. So let's compare it now. So it's matching almost the posterior. So here are some details now. So here's the plus sigma missing. Yeah? So we don't have it in here. And that's something that I, I had to think about for a while, but I think I figured it out. So the thing is, what about the noise? So that is the question now. Why is in our derivation there some noise, and why don't we have the noise in here? The reason, um, we set the sigma to 0, and that made the 
form up here particularly easy and nice. However, in general, of course, yeah, the distribution of the Y1s are noisy measurements. So to the covariance matrix for the training data, we need to add this diagonal term, which adds now measurement noise to the Y1s. Okay? So actually, each of the Y1s, the correlation is not changing by the measurement noise, because the measurement noise is independent of location and of everything. But the overall variance of the Y1 is slightly larger, so we need this plus sigma squared. If we again plug it into the formula, now it looks quite nice. So now it's matching nicely the mass. Okay? So a very nice approach is just to use this formula up here and then to apply the formula for the Gaussian conditional. That's like the super short version for the GPs, the shortest way to derive the mass. Okay? Of course, now this looks a bit ugly. So why there's no plus sigma squared back here? So that's another question that one could have. And let's try to answer that one as well. Um, so why not adding there the noise? So what would it mean if we would add the noise over there? So let's look at it. Let's look at the joint Gaussian with measurement noise. In that case, we can again apply the formulas. And now we get this additional term over here. Yeah, so now we have this plus sigma squared i in here. And that actually is the posterior predictive distribution. Yeah? So the posterior distribution of a GP is typically a function, a GP over functions. However, we could evaluate it at locations, and we get noise-free measurements, right? Like there would be no noise, because we have measured them. We inferred them from training data. Yeah? However, in the posterior predictive distribution, the variance is larger because we would expect some measurement error as well. The posterior predictive distribution is telling us something if I now do tomorrow some measurements with my device that has measurement noise, I would expect a larger variance on the solution. Okay? So that's basically the answer. So typically for the true value, which we sometimes called f sub x2, yeah, so we distinguish between f of x and the y, yeah, the f is the true value, but the y is typically then the measured value where we have to add some noise. Yeah? However, for the f of x2, we typically do not add the sigma squared. That's only relevant for the posterior predictive distribution. So here's the overview of all these different styles, and it, it just with the, with the explanation. So in the first case, we consider noise-free measurements, yeah? and we are interested in the true value of the test locations. The normal case that is most commonly used is the one that we assume noisy measurements. So we will have another sigma squared up here. And we are interested in the true values on our test places. But sometimes we want to have the posterior predictive distribution. And then we would also add some noise over here. And sometimes when you look at the, at the book or when you look at papers with GPs, sometimes there is a sigma square there, sometimes there is not. Then please look at the, on this slide and it should clarify what their assumptions are. Yeah? Because often people are not so precise on it. So the, the key thing is that you know that the y's and the f of x i's, they are different things. However, it can get more confusing Sometimes people include this measurement noise into the kernel function. Yeah? So you could just edit the diagonal term to the kernel function with a delta kernel, where just you say, only if a and b are equal, then I'm adding something. And then it gets more confusing for the inferencing. But, so that's better to think about it like this. Um, so far, so good. I think that's it, what I wanted to say today. Um, Next time, we will look at kernel design a little bit, OK? So we will look at a couple of kernel functions, and we discuss some of the things. And I hope I can show you the Matern function. I hope I'm able to repair it. Yeah? And then we can also sample from it and see some animations maybe with the Matern kernel as well, which could be quite interesting. So thanks for your attention, and I see you on next Monday.